Welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, we're going to go over two comments, one from Green Tree. Uh, she pointed out something about the uh, Washington, D.C. temple because within the last couple days, uh, CBS did a tour of the temple with Elder Christofferson and Elder Bednar. Uh, and it's pretty interesting. And then we're also going to talk about the Angel Moroni uh, when he dropped his trumpet off the Salt Lake Temple back in 2020. There's really interesting details about that. We've already covered this a couple times, but there's a couple new things. That's why I'm bringing it up again. Um, this is a comment from Joe Signs. So uh, first we'll start with Green Tree. Green Tree says, did you see the painting of Jesus in red for his second coming and angels in a central part of the new uh, Washington, D.C. temple. And uh, she's referring to the, the newly renovated temple. Uh, they really want our minds that way. And uh, yes, they do. I really think that they do. Like I pointed out before, I've taken notes, I've watched and taken notes for the different area um, member devotionals. We had the one here for me for Kansas, Oklahoma. Uh, there was the European devotional. There was the California devotional. Um, you can search my channel. You can watch those if you want to. And uh, they do it in the same room. And uh, very prominently, you have a picture of Christ and his second coming. It's like the one that you can see the best. Uh, the, the camera angle typically kind of looks... Um, in that direction and so it's pretty obvious when you're looking at it and then you have this example here so what she's talking about is you can see here you have the two apostles and their wives and then you have the cbs guy from uh, cbs sunday morning uh whoever watches that i don't uh but over there in the background as they're walking toward the temple because there's, there's like this um kind of like sky bridge thing that goes to the the Washington DC temple, um, you can see Christ in the background and it's a second coming Im image. He's wearing red. He has his angels. There's a better, let's uh, get a better view of it. Let me see if I can find it. Okay. No, go back. No. Okay. There it is. See, uh, unmistakably it's a second coming, um, painting. You have the angels in the background here and then Christ coming down in the cloud, uh, wearing red. So, it, it, it's interesting, and, and I do think that it's very purposeful that they did that. Um, it made me think a little bit about the fact that uh, we had Elder Bednar and we had Elder uh, Christofferson that were doing this tour. Oh, here's the Sky Bridge, by the way. Uh, kind of cool. Um, so here we have two Davids. Now, I've already done a video about two Davids because it had been propo proposed uh, somewhere else that there was a two David prophecy, as in the the two witnesses in Jerusalem would be they would both be named David. I haven't been able to find anything to substantiate that at all. Uh, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, but I, believe me, I've I've tried to find it and I have not been able to find it. What I have found, though, uh, this is on BYU uh, Idaho. There's this thing by Rodney Turner. It's called the Two Davids. And it kind of talks about a prophecy of the two Davids, but it's not um, what we were just talking about. Let me just read a little bit here. I'll put the I'll put this in the description in case you want to read the whole thing. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it says two Davids appear in the Old Testament, although separated by three millennia. Uh, they are bound to one another by blood and by promise. The first ruled Israel in the 11th century before Christ. The second will rule Israel in the coming age. Of course, or of the first, much is known. Of the second, much remains to be revealed. So it's talking about the first David, um, the first one in the 11th century before Christ. It's talking about King David, right? Um, but then uh, I guess there's supposed to be another one in the latter days that will be King of Israel and his name will be David. Um, so let's go. I just want to read a couple more things here. Um, let's see, sorry. I can't highlight on this because it's a PDF. Um, okay, the second David. The, the king who will yet reign in Israel is the second David, a descendant of David. He will be the first king since Solomon to rule over all 12 tribes. Uh, he is mentioned by name in Hosea, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Hosea, a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel in the 8th century before Christ, wrote, quote, And afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, 
and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Uh, over 200 years at later, Jeremiah prophesied, quote, But they, Israel, shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Uh, now, I, I haven't looked into this too much further than the, just this thing. I, I tend to think that the David that's being referred to is Christ himself, but I don't know. Zion and Jerusalem, the shepherd of Israel is going to gather all of his scattered sheep. His labors begin with Ephraim and Zion, and the end with Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, where, therefore, does King David fit into the prophetic scheme of things? How does he relate to the Latter-day Saints? The answer given by Joseph Smith and his associates is that Christ's church will beget Christ's millennial kingdom. However, the church of Christ is not the kingdom of God. They will be related, but separate institutions. Of course, because in the, in the millennium, um, Christ is going to be the pol politically the actual king of the world, right? Uh, but there's still going to be the church and it'll be separate. Uh, consequently, the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the Jews and the second David will follow and uh, be a, a direct result of the fulfillment of the prophecies pertaining to the establishment of Zion in the new Jerusalem in America. The Lord will redeem Zion many years before he redeems Jerusalem. Um, now, Joseph Smith's teachings. Now, I don't, I don't know about this because it, okay, just like, uh, neither the prophet Joseph Smith nor any of the earlier leaders of the church ever established the actual identity of this David. After the prophet's martyrdom, however, it was rumored, and we have to take note of that, that this is a rumor. Um, it was rumored in Nauvoo that he believed that one of his posterity, possibly David Hiram Smith, a son born in November 1844, would be that David. Uh, while much a notion, while such a notion is ludic ludicrous to us, uh, gifted as we are with 145 years of hindsight, it must have seemed plausible at the time. Okay, so yeah, I'm not going to read this entire thing. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of great stuff here. Now, it has been noted. Uh, I think. Well, I think I noted it actually. I, I don't know. Um, if you go to list of Israeli prime ministers. Uh, the very first prime minister of Israel, the modern nation state of Israel, uh, was David, David Ben Gurion. Now, I, I'm a little shaky as far as like this this prophecy goes. Um, maybe because I just need to look into it more. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, th this is like the only place that I've really heard of such a thing, uh, a prophecy of two Davids. Um, Here's another thing. This is from BYU. Uh, King David re remains today one of the most renowned Old Testament figures. His personality, spiritual sensitivity, um, creative abilities, military victories, and leadership carried him to the pinnacle of popularity. He had the potential to become an ideal king, but his kingship deteriorated after his adultery with Bathsheba and uh, his involvement in Uriah's death. However, prophecy states that a model ruler in the last days will be raised up uh, from David's lineage. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that, quote, The throne and king kingdom of David is to be taken from him and given to another by the name of David in the last days, raised up out of his lineage. So, I guess that's pretty explicit, talking about someone other than Christ, if that... If that's what he's saying here. Elder Orson Hyde in his dedicatory prayer on the Mount of Olives, October 24th, 1984, prophesied that Jews would return to Jerusalem and that in time a leader called David, even a descendant from the loins of ancient David, would be their king. Um, this predicted figure corresponds to a promised messianic event. Hosea, speaking shortly, uh, before the loss of nor northern Israel, foretold that Israelites would return in the latter days, quote, and seek the Lord their God and David their king. Jeremiah prophesied of Israel in Judah's future righteousness and of, quote, David their king, whom I, the Lord, will raise up unto them, end quote. And in Ezekiel it is written, and I will set one 
set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a, pre a prince among them. End quote. Speaking to Joseph Smith, uh, the angel Moroni cited Old Testament passages telling of significant figures who would be involved with Christ's millennial reign. As prophesied in Isaiah, it appears that the two persons are spoken of, are spoken of a rod and a root, uh, one a leader on whom there is laid much power. The other person will be, well, sorry, the other a person with special priesthood keys. Uh, these leaders are believed by some to be two forerunners spoken of in rabbinic literature, one from Joseph and one from Judah. What? As prophesied, it appears that two persons are spoken of. And so, okay, in rabbinic literature, they think one of Joseph and one of Judah. And that probably ties into the idea of Moshiach ben Joseph, or Yosef, I mean, and Moshiach ben David, which are like the two messiahs. So I don't know if that's what they're referring to in this rabbinic literature. Um, but anyway, okay, moving on. Although noble attributes and spiritual powers characterize both these messianic servants, okay, yeah, messianic servants, uh, I think, whatever. Jesus Christ exemplifies these qualities perfectly. Jesus is the exemplar prophet, priest, and king. He identified himself as the prophet like unto Moses and as a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is king of kings, greater than all other leaders of all time. Some see in Jesus Christ the complete fulfillment of the prophecy of a future David. Others feel that while the titles and functions of the future Davidic king could apply to Jesus, there will also be another righteous king by the name of David in the last days, a leader from the loins of David, and thus of Judah. So, so I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to think. I, um, reading the scriptures, I probably would never would have read it as like, oh, there's going to be a future David king. Um, this is this is like poetically or you know referring to Christ because Christ and David they're usually associated. He's the son of David. He he descends through David. Uh, he has the right to the to the throne to the kingship. He is the king. He's the rightful heir. So I don't know. I, I at this point I don't know what to think about this. Um, and frankly, I don't really care too much about it. If it happens, then it happens. If not, then fine. Um, maybe I'll find more information about this in the future. I've never heard any church leader talking about this. Uh, if you have, feel free to put it in the comments or send me an email. But let's pretend that it's true. Let's pretend, let's pretend that uh, there's going to be a future David that's uh, aside from Christ that becomes king of Israel. Not the earth, but the king of Israel. Well, uh, one interesting thing about David A. Bednar is that his area of assignment is over the Middle East. So if the second coming happened right now, and if Christ decided to appoint um, one of the 12 apostles over uh, Israel, Jerusalem, that area, it, 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 most likely it would be David A. Bednar, I would think. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if there's any significance that we have two Davids here that are showing the world the the Washington DC temple you know the the capital of the United States I don't I don't know but it's just if nothing else it's interesting isn't it okay so thank you green tree let's move on to Joe signs he says when Moroni dropped his trumpet the next day the church announced to bring back missionaries also there's a cool video rendering of the earthquake caused a chain reaction of earthquakes that radiated radiated from Salt Lake like, Mer like, Moroni blew his trumpet one last time, and it created waves. Like, sound waves. Pretty cool. Also, on my mission, lightning struck the temple and melted Moroni's trumpet. Our mission president said that whenever something happens to the temple, pay attention. It always means something. And uh, I definitely think that's true. Think about, think about what happened with the St. George Temple. They originally made the spire too short, too stumpy, and... Brigham Young wasn't happy about it, and then later, after he passed away, lightning struck, and then they 
they made the the spire the way that um, Brigham Young wanted it to be made. Um, I, I do think that that was divine intervention. Um, but especially when you think about the Salt Lake Temple, uh, the Salt Lake Temple is an icon. It is, it is a symbol. It uh, represents the headquarters of the church. Even though we have the church office building, we have the administration building, uh, most people, when they think of about the headquarters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they think of the Salt Lake Temple. So when something happens to that temple, and when it seems to be an act of God, meaning something that is not easily replicated by man, or maybe impossible for man to replicate, uh, such as what happened here, where there was a 5.7 earthquake in Magna, which is west of Salt Lake City. It uh, had enough force to dislodge the trumpet from Moroni's hands, which is odd. And uh, I remember when it happened because, you know, I was watching a bunch of other YouTube channels, non-LDS YouTube channels, channels that have to do with modern-day secret combinations, Gadiat and Robbers, and... Um, you know, stuff like that. And uh, they took it as a sign. That, that, that showed up in a number of different videos of these non-members uh, of the church uh, from other religions and, and so forth. And uh, they looked at it as a sign of an angel dropping, dropping a trumpet and that it could be a sign of the times. Okay, So this, this created shockwaves not just within the church for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear, but those outside the church that also have eyes to see and ears to hear. So I wanted to look into the details of this. Now, uh, as far as that video goes, I, I don't think I found the video that he was referencing, but there is this uh, little video. It's two minutes, 47 seconds, and um, it kind of shows you uh, the impact that the earthquake had on the surrounding area as far as this uh, shake index goes. It goes from weak to extreme, right? And it goes from blue to red. So this was the epicenter right here where the star is. So uh, you'll have to let me know, Joe, if, if, uh, if you know exactly where to find that video. Uh, put it in the comments below. Um, but anyway, uh, I, would, I would encourage you to check this out. This talks about the science and um, the details with what happened. I went to the USGS um, earthquake website and I went back to that time. So this was in March of 2020. And yeah, you see this, um, you see a swarm of earthquakes. And the one in question is this one right here in blue, 5.7. Okay. And then if you just go straight over here, oh, oops, I'm too far out. Let's go right here. So over here, this is the Magna area. There's the Salt Lake International Airport right there. You keep going east, and then downtown Salt Lake is like right here. Uh, this grid right here, these are the avenues. And then um, Salt Lake, it's, uh, the Salt Lake Temple itself is right here. You can see this oval. This is the tabernacle. So, you know, uh, just almost directly west that, that made it so that the angel Moroni dropped his trumpet. Um, as far as like other earthquakes in the area or aftershocks, um, I don't really see any, but there was a pretty large swarm, which uh, it, that happens. You know, that's not like too uncommon. Um, if you come out here, uh, de yeah, down here, at that same time in Puerto Rico, they, they were having a big uh, earthquake swarm right here. Although... Not all large quakes have swarms associated with them. Here's one right here. This is 4.8, Santa Maria, uh, Mexico. Uh, you have some other ones here, El Salvador, Honduras. So anyway, uh, yeah, it, it did have a bunch of, a lot of swarming, which I don't know. In Utah, I'm not sure if that's too, too common like this, like what we're seeing here, but I'm no expert. Uh, here's today. This is the current earthquake map. And um, oh, it looks like we have one here in Kansas. Uh, 2.6. None in Utah. There's one in Idaho up here. And that's uh, 2.7. Stanley, Idaho. Is anyone in Stanley? Um, there's always a ton of earthquakes happening 
in Hawaii. There's always like a swarm like this going on, as well as Alaska. This is nothing out of the ordinary. And then California, there's always a bunch. And then there's usually a bunch in um, Oklahoma. So I'm kind of I'm kind of surprised that there aren't any right now. It's like that's one of the very active spots for earthquakes. I think it's because of fracking that they do. Um, over here, what, what do we got? 5.1. So you can see here, there's not like a big swarm like what you saw in Salt Lake. So sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. But um, let's get into some more of the details about this. So first, I want to point out, this is this article is the 19th of April, 2019. And it says, plans unveiled for Salt Lake Temple renovation. So they announced the plans to renovate the Salt Lake Temple to, to do the um, uh, work on the foundations to prepare it for earthquakes in 2019. So this was a year before the Magna earthquake that made Angel Moroni drop, drop his trumpet. So uh, this announcement happened a year before. And then a year later, on March 18th, that's when the earthquake hit, okay? So, um, almost, almost exactly a year later, pretty close. The angel Moroni atop the Salt Lake Temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints sustained damage during an earthquake that rocked the Wasatch Front. Workers have been preparing uh, the temple for renovations, including a substantial upgrade to the temple's foundation to help keep it structurally sound in an earthquake. So, it's interesting. It's interesting that a year before they started this undertaking, a year into it, uh, this happens. Okay, And then the quake caused damage across the valley, inclu including transmitters used to broadcast TV. Uh, bricks broke from buildings and scattered across roads and sidewalks. And the Salt Lake International Airport closed after the tower was evacuated. So, and that's kind of almost like symbolic right there too, that transmitters um, were damaged or disrupted because, you know, the transmitters are used for um, sending signals, right? Just like a horn is used to send a signal, a signal of warning, you have these transmitters that also uh, sustain some damage. So that's, that's an interesting concept there. Here's a picture of the Angel Moroni without the trumpet. Um, there were a few interesting numbers that I, that I saw as I was looking through this. So the earthquake was a 5.7, right? And uh, anytime that there's a 7, I always think that that's interesting, but I'm not going to take make too much out of it. Um, now, this happened, it says here, it could have been much worse for the 127-year-old temple. So it's interesting that in its 127th year um, or age, that that's when it happened, when it was a seven. So another interesting thing. And then uh, the trumpet was recovered by a worker who made his way up a ladder and around the spire to pick up the 70-inch piece. Now, 70 is an interesting number because think about it like this. The trumpet, the, the symbolism is the angel blowing his trumpet to warn the nations and bring the gospel uh, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, right? So the nations of the earth, uh, in within Judaism and, um, you know, within Judaism, they have this concept of the nation of Israel and then the 70 Gentile nations. It's not, I don't think that they mean for it to be literal. I don't know if they think that during the Messianic age, in their uh, view, if there literally will be 70 nations, but... Uh, that's what they call, essentially, the Gentile nations, is the 70 nations. So it's interesting that this angel holding a trumpet that's 70 inches long, well, the trumpet falls, as if to say the, the warning to the 70 nations is over. The time of the Gentiles is over. Now, I know that there will be some that will argue against that, and I'm not saying that it is, but, you know... Uh, there's kind of two parts to the, the times of the Gentiles. One part, we've talked about this before on the channel, one part refers to the time that Jerusalem is trodden underfoot uh, by the Gentiles. So when Israel returned and became a nation, it's like that pretty much ended uh, as far as like them physically being back in the land of Israel. Uh, as far as the gospel being taken to the world, uh, to the Gentiles, who knows? 
but the thing that's interesting with this story um it wasn't it wasn't one day later it was actually two days later that missionaries got called back and, and we're going to read that in just a minute um but first let's look at some of these pictures here you have the angel moroni and uh well the trumpet's gone um here's another angle here's another angle you can barely see it right here but here is the trumpet it's it's right at the base of this main uh triangle spire uh right here by this smaller spire okay like at the top of the the buttress um here it is again i'm not sure what this is circling it doesn't have a, a description right here but uh here's the trumpet it's right here here's a better view of the trumpet so you get the idea and the trumpet is pretty bent too it's not like it's just like it's still straight it, it's like been bent in a in a cartoonish way so okay now here is an article this is from byu hawaii uh the title says students say utah earthquake that damaged angel moroni statue is a sign of the end times by brooke gurin uh, march 30th 2020 uh, students shared their belief <coughs> sorry students shared they believed the damage to the statue coincides with living in the last days while others said this event means everyone should be vigilant and prepared according to doctrine from the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints there will be a second coming of jesus christ to the earth sometime in the future and an indication of christ's return is great turmoil in the world sam tobin tobin a junior from columbia studying business said a friend shared with him quote if you look at the statue without the trumpet it looks like he's looking at a watch as if he's waiting for the second coming end quote now i really like that because look at that here here's a picture of it it's like he's looking at his watch he's right um now that may just be coincidental it may be you know an additional layer to the metaphor and the symbolism going on here but uh well that thought got put in his head and uh like i said before this occurrence it sent shockwaves shockwaves not only within our church but among others others that are watching for the signs of the times okay uh the lord i think communicated with many specifically those that are that have eyes to hear eyes to see ears to hear he's communicating with them that time is short and here we have in this byu idaho um article you know evidence that people uh heard it loud and clear and they understand what it means okay so <clears throat> it happened on uh march 18th and then on march 20th which is two days later we have this letter from the first presidency and the quorum of the 12 apostles it says dear brothers and sisters we take very seriously the health and safety of our missionaries and of those they teach the rapidly developing travel advi advisories and restrictions that are emerging around the world uh, present significant logistical and other challenges therefore the following temporary adjustments are being made one in the coming weeks based upon world conditions substantial numbers of missionaries will likely need to be returned to their home nations to continue their service this will be done in a systematic way based on the urgency of travel restrictions the level of covid 19 concern and other considerations number two returning missionaries will go through a 14-day period of self-isolation and then may be assigned to serve within their home country based on local conditions three the term of service for missionaries returning to or serving within the united states will likely be reduced to accommodate the large number of missionaries returning from around the world now that that really sucks <laughs> i would not like to have my mission cut short i had the the privilege of being able to do a full two years in spain and um that that would have been a big bummer um but anyway number four missionary training centers mtcs worldwide will not receive new missionaries uh, mtc training for missionaries will take place through technology and missionaries will be sent to their assigned mission as soon as possible uh, as we evaluate changing conditions further necessary adjustments will be made here's a salt lake tribune article um, 
you have pictures here. It's it's called uh, "Coronavirus Brings Hundreds of LDS Missionaries Back to Utah," right? And so people sad about what's going on. Um, okay, and then six days later, there's another letter, and this letter says, "Dear brothers and sisters, in our letter of March twentieth, twenty twenty." We indicated that the original term of service for missionaries brought back early to the United States would likely be reduced to accommodate the large number of missionaries returning from around the world. Number one, where possible, in some areas of the world, missionaries will remain and complete their regular term of, term of service. Two, elders and, elders and sisters who were originally called to other international assignments are returning to the United States and Canada and have completed at least 18 months and 15 months, respectively, will be released. So, some of them, and it's not just the United States missionaries, but some of the returning missionaries from these other countries, their um, missions are being cut short. Uh, number three, elders who are currently serving in a mission in the United States and Canada, who are scheduled to complete their service on or before September 1st, 2020, will be released when they have re served 21 months. So, uh, for stateside in Canada, 21 months for elders, and then 18 months for those outside the United States, and for sisters outside of the United States, 15 months. And then they say, as we evaluate changing conditions, further adjustments will be made. So, um, I looked on the Hebrew calendar, just to see if there was anything significant going on in the Jewish world. Here we have the 8th, or the 18th, I mean, which was the 22nd of Adar, which is the 12th month. And um, the week before, we had Purim. Uh, and then uh, exactly one, two, three weeks later, Passover started. So I'm not sure I would say there was any correlation or significance Um I don't know, other than just like this being exactly three weeks before Passover started, but I'm not sure, you know, that you can really go down that road. But anyway, um, so yeah, so uh, there was, now, so there was kind of like a shockwave thing happening. Uh, it was an earthquake swarm. Like I said, it's not too out of the ordinary, but um, I don't see that all too frequently in places like Utah. Um I think I actually did maybe last year, but it was like a lot smaller as far as like uh, the size of the, the aftershocks and the swarms because uh, they were more like in the 1.0 range and stuff like that. Um, if I'm remembering right, I could be remembering wrong. But uh, so that that is interesting, though. It's interesting that it affected the entire valley. Uh, I was not there at the time because by that point, Let's see, when was it? 2020? So I guess I was, um, well, I was just transitioning from Arizona to Kansas at that time. That, that was like our last month before we moved to Kansas. So I was in Arizona at the time. So I didn't personally experience this, but yeah, the message was uh, sent and I think it was loud and clear <clears throat> and those watching heard it. And here we are. Uh, two years later, it's April 18th, so almost exactly two years later, like, a, you know, two two years and a month later, <clears throat> excuse me, and now we have President Nelson uh, with his last conference, his last talk, talking about uh, the time is now, <laughs> and I, I would, I would again, I would emphasize what they said before. I heard Sister Nelson say, uh, don't put question marks behind the prophet's statements. Put exclamation marks, right? So if we if we're to go to that talk, let's see. Uh, Nelson, the time is now. That's church news. Okay, I'll just go to the church website, LDS.org. Sorry, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I, I want to do it right now. Okay, Gospel Library, General Conference, April 2022, last talk, oh, sorry, now is the time. <clears throat> so picture this, 
now is the time with an exclamation mark. That really gives you the sense of urgency, doesn't it? Uh, especially, especially with all the urgency of this last conference. And uh, one thing that was brought up is that 17 years ago, okay, 17, remember how much 17 comes up on the channel, 17 years ago, when he was Elder Nelson, he gave another talk with a similar name. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Elder Nelson, now is the time general conference. Um, come on, where is it? I might have to do a separate video about that. Um, Andrew Lamb and Bob D had told me about it. The fact that he's repeating it, uh, I feel like that begs for us to like pay attention, like seriously, what he's saying. Oh yeah, I remember that uh, this this uh, poem was repeated. So it was in his first talk, and then it was repeated in this one as well. So let me let me see if I can do a search using the words from the poem. Um, go like this. Come over here. Elder Nelson, um, and then we'll put this in quotes. Okay, here we go, 2005. Now is the time to prepare. Now is the time to prepare. We'll see how he ends the, the, now is the time to prepare. Then when death comes, we can move forward toward the celestial glory that Heavenly Father has prepared for his faithful children. Meanwhile, for souring loved ones left behind, such as our family and me, the sting of death is soothed by the steadfast face in Christ. Okay. So, not really second coming talk there. Here, he's talking more in the sense of now, like this life is the time to prepare. Let me look at the footnotes, see if there's anything that stands out. Um, oh, there's a lot here. Let me see if he says second coming. Oops. No. Let's see if he says return. <clears throat> okay, whatever. Anyway, um, I still take this uh, very seriously just because the fact that he's doing a similar talk, it's 17 years apart. Right. And uh, especially how he's been talking the last few years. The last few years, he hasn't been talking so much in the just everyday gospel sense. He's been talking in the second coming sense. So, and then uh, you'll remember <clears throat> the most the most stunning thing to me is this last line right here. Because th this seals the deal as far as that goes. It says, ye shall be my people and I will be your God. When you go to that footnote... It takes you to Jeremiah 30, 22. When you go there, this is this has everything to do with the second coming. In the last days, Judah and Israel will be gathered to their own lands. David, their king, Messiah, will reign over them. Uh, which is interesting, because we were just talking about the, the two Davids. Um, so in this sense here, it's talking about David, Christ, will, will rule over them. So, but anyway, it says, um, I already went over this before, but I'm just doing it again. Um, and their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governor shall proceed from the midst of them, and I will cause them to draw near, and he shall approach unto me, for who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord? And ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. And fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it, and until he have performed the intents of his heart in the latter days, ye shall consider it. So this is how he ends his last talk, is now is the time, and then he says, may we be a people worthy of the Lord. That's almost like if he knew that it's coming really soon. It's like, well, I hope uh, I hope everyone's ready. May we be a, a people of ready for the Lord, like like he said in Jeremiah. So anyway, 
that's going to be it for this one. Um, hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below, and also make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.